go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, as we have lifted our voices to you in song, as we have greeted one another, as we have studied your word already in our connection groups, Lord, I pray that you will help us to receive your word. Help us to receive your word, not as a word of man, but as your true and powerful word. As we look at the cost of being a disciple, I pray that our hearts will not focus solely on that, but will focus on the Christ that we are following. Help us to fall more in love with him now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, grab your Bibles and meet with me in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 will be in verses 34 through Mark chapter 9, verse 1, as we continue in our series called Disciple. And we looked at last week the Christ of discipleship, and we looked at Mark 8, verses uh, 27 through 33. And today we're kind of continuing this overarching story by looking at the cost of discipleship. Now, you may or may not be wired like me, but I find that when I'm forced to do something, I hate it. But when I choose to do something, I like it. When I'm forced to do something, I dread it. For instance, if I'm forced to do a project around the house, I'm dreading it. I'm focused solely on what I'm going to give up to have to do this project. I don't want to do it. But if I choose to do a project, even if it's the exact same one, I tend to think I'm going to enjoy it a little more. I'm a little more excited for I don't like being forced to do things, but I like it when I choose to do them. And this past week, this character trait of mine was very apparent as I started my doctoral studies at Southern Seminary. You see, I'm really excited for all the seminars that I've chosen to take, that I've decided I'm going to take. This past week, I wasn't in those seminars. I was in the ones they forced me to take. The ones that you have to take to go any further, the ones that I had been dreading for months now. You probably heard me complain about them at some point. Definitely Renee heard me complain about them. I was not excited to take these seminars. I was so focused on what I was going to have to sacrifice to take them. I didn't want to sacrifice my time. I didn't want to sacrifice my money especially. I didn't want to sacrifice the gas necessary to drive to Louisville and back. And driving to Louisville is just no fun. Like, can we all address that? It's not enjoyable. And so I wasn't looking forward to these seminars. I was dreading them. But my wife, as she typically does, because if you didn't know, Renee is a far better person and Christian than me. She reminded me that oftentimes what I'm being forced to do, I end up liking more than what I've chosen to do. And I wish I could tell you she was wrong. Like I, Every part of my being wanted to come up here and say she finally got it wrong, but she didn't. She was right. And I really enjoyed these seminars. They ended up being really formative for me. They taught me what I'm going to have to do to endure in this program, but not just endure in the program, but how to make necessary choices to still be a faithful husband, to be a faithful pastor. And so they were very formative. They gave me a good foundation to start with. I gained a lot from these seminars. But when I was just focused on what I was going to sacrifice to take them, I was miserable. I dreaded it. But if I would have known what I was going to gain from them, I would have been excited for it. Because the reality is when we just focus on what we're sacrificing to do anything, we're going to dread it if we don't understand what we're gaining from it. That's really how a lot of people approach their relationship with Christ. They focus so much on what they're giving up to follow Jesus on what they're giving up to be a Christian, on what they can't do or what they shouldn't do. And we focus so much on all the do-nots that we forget what we're gaining from following Christ. And if we're just focused on what we're sacrificing, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be angry. You're going to be bitter. You're going to be jealous of a world that doesn't have to give up what you're giving up. And you're going to be immature in your faith. You can't grow as a disciple if you're just focusing on what you have to give up to be a disciple. And so if we're going to grow as Christ followers, if we're going to grow in our relationship with Christ, we're going to be the disciples that he saved us to be, which is what we should all desire to be as believers, then we need to realize that what we gain from being a disciple is greater than the cost. Recognize that what we gain as a disciple is greater than the cost. 
And here in Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 34, Jesus does lay out the very real cost of following him. It is not something you can just add on to your life or a weekend hobby you can take up. No, if you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to be a disciple, there is a cost. And the cost is high. And we see this in this scene where Jesus calls the crowds to count the cost. Christ called to count the cost. And we see in verse 34, calling the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So last week we looked at this story where Peter confessed Jesus as the Messiah, but as we begin to look at that story more, Peter really didn't get it. Peter didn't understand who Jesus was, and it's important for us to know that because how we view Jesus will determine how we follow Jesus. If we don't view Jesus correctly, then we're not going to really count the cost like Jesus calls us to do here. If we don't have a right view of Jesus, then why would we want to follow someone who says you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me? I mean, that's a pretty high cost, isn't it? That's not just, hey, just walk an aisle, say a prayer, go home, don't change your life. This is a radical transformation and a radical call for all those who were following Christ. That following him is not going to be easy. I mean, could you imagine being a disciple and hearing Jesus call the crowds close to him, moving from this intimate setting to now, there's a massive crowd around him, and you think Jesus is going to tell them how he's going to lead, Jesus is going to tell them how he's going to reign, and instead he says, if any of you want to follow me, You have to deny yourself, be willing to die, and follow me. What Jesus says here goes against every single church growth strategy we've been taught for the last 50 years. We've been taught as a church when people come in, we want to cater to them. We want to tell them, it's okay, hey, you can come in. You don't really do anything to sign this card, walk an aisle, it's okay. And Jesus says, no. If you're going to follow me, I don't care how big the crowd is, you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you everything. Because being a follower of Christ means that we have to take action. It's not just something you can add on to your life. It's not just a weekend hobby you can pick up. It is your life. Being a disciple defines who you are at the core of your being if you're saved. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you have to first deny yourself. Now, the culture we live in today, to deny yourself is not something we're going around telling a whole lot of people. What do we tell people oftentimes? Just do what makes you happy. Just be you. Just do whatever it takes. You just focus on yourself. You just pursue your dreams, pursue your goals. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you have to kill your dreams. If you're going to follow me, you have to kill your desire for self. If you're going to follow me, you got to lay it all down. You can't focus on yourself anymore. You have to deny everything the world says to pursue. You've got to deny that American dream. That white picket fence, and according to statistics, 2.5 kids, which I have no idea how that works. But you have to deny that to follow Jesus. You have to deny those personal vendettas, that personal dream you have. Jesus says you have to lay it down. You have to kill it. So what is, and he's not just saying that you have to deny yourself a little bit of inconvenience or a little bit of convenience on Sunday morning or Wednesday nights. See, when we talk about denying ourselves, we often want to think, well, we can do the bare minimum. I mean, let's be real, when we're called to do something we don't want to do, how often do we try to ex- uh, succeed expectations, and how often do we want to just settle for the bare minimum? Am I the only one who's like that? When I'm forced to do something, I don't want to do my best, I want to do enough. So for many of us, we hear this call to count the cost, to deny yourself, and we think, well, I'll, I'll deny an hour on Sundays. I'll deny the extra hour of sleep I can get. Don't ask me to come to connection groups, though, because I'm not denying that hour. I'll, I'll deny that on Wednesday nights. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll deny that Wednesday night date night that I might want to go on. I, I can do that for Jesus. And what Jesus doesn't want you to do is he doesn't want you to take this call to deny yourself and just kind of compartmentalize it and put it in a box. He doesn't want you just to put it over here and say, well, I'll deny myself when it comes to my religion, but that's just one part of my life. Everything else is free game. Everything else is my choice. I don't have to deny myself in the rest of the world. I just have to deny myself when I want to be religious. But Jesus says we're to deny ourselves in every area of our lives. You're to deny yourself in your marriage, in your family, in your job, in your school. Wherever you find yourself right now, Jesus calls you to deny yourself in it. And the relationship where this call to deny yourself is most apparent is the marriage relationship. 
I mean, after all, it's the relationship that Paul says in Ephesians 5 reflects the relationship of Christ and his church. It is symbolic to that. So in the marriage relationship, what are we called to do? Deny ourselves for one another. But our problem is we don't do a whole lot of that anymore in our culture, do we? We're really self-centered. We're focused on self. We don't want to deny ourselves. We read Paul's command in Ephesians 5 for wives to submit and husbands to love, and we want to kind of tense up about that and say, no, that's wrong. What do I have to do there? And especially for women, it seems like you all got the rough end of the deal there. In Ephesians 5, Paul says women submit. It says husbands love. So a lot of men love that passage. We like it. Like, oh, all I got to do is love. Hey, hey, wife, you got to listen to me. That's what we think that means. But what's going on in Ephesians 5 is Paul is describing a mutual giving up of self. A mutual denial of self. It just looks differently if you're the wife or the husband. For the wife, submit does not mean that you are giving authority over to a superior. See, when we think of submitting, what do we think of? MMA, wrestling, you put someone in position, you overpower them, they tap out, they submit. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying you as two equals created in the image of God. For to submit means the woman just gives up. And gives up what? Her own personal desires, personal vendettas, her personal passion to maybe be her own boss and not listen to anybody, the call to this is to give that up. Deny yourself. And then husbands, the call to love your wife as Christ loves the church, that's actually a harsher command than what Paul has told the women. We got the rough end in the stick on that one. There's two verses dedicated to the women. The rest of that passage is for the men. We're called to love our wives, and what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you just send her a card on Valentine's Day. Does it mean you just buy her flowers from time to time? To deny yourself in your marriage, to love her means that you put aside your own personal wants, your own personal needs. You put aside your own personal gain, your personal vendors, you put aside everything, and you prioritize your wife. And if necessary, you die for her. You put her life above yours. The marriage relationship can be described as a mutual denial of self. It's not about you, it's about the other person. And when it comes to our relationship with Christ, what has Christ done for us? Well, he gave up his life. He laid down his life. He died on the cross for our sin to make us new, to forgive us. And in turn, he says, you must be willing to die for me. Deny yourself. Because he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross for you. Deny yourself. Put to death your own personal ambitions, your own personal dreams. Put it all to death for the sake of following Christ. It's a high cost, isn't it? It's not easy to follow Jesus. It was never meant to be. But he's not done yet. He says, deny yourself. But then he says, take up your cross and follow me. Now, in our modern culture, the cross has kind of become a staple of our popular culture, hasn't it? We wear it as necklaces, we get tattoos of the cross on ourselves, we put it in our churches where it's all polished and it looks neat and nice, and so we think this call to take up your cross, I can do that, the cross doesn't look that heavy. I can do it. But when Jesus told these people who knew that crucifixion was the highest form of Roman torture they could possibly inflict on another human being, so barbaric, they would not even crucify their own Roman citizens with it because it was that extreme. Jesus is saying, you must be willing to take this cross and die for me. This isn't figurative. Christ is saying, you must be willing at a drop of a dime to lay down your life for my glory. That's a high cost, isn't it? That's heavy, and it needs to be. Jesus didn't phone it in with us. He didn't do the bare minimum. He gave his life for us. He gave his life for the people who rebelled against him, who sinned against him, who spat in his face, who chose the world over him. And Jesus came and died for us. And in turn, he says, if you're going to follow me, you must be willing to do likewise. It's a high cost, but it's understandable. Christ gave it all for us. We must be willing to give it all for him to lay everything down for him. But let's also address the elephant in the room. We live in the United States of America. We're probably not going to die for our faith. For the most part, it's accepted. And let me just get on a soapbox real quick. Don't ever say we're persecuted in this country when we're not being put to death. You might get made fun of. That's not persecution. We have brothers and sisters in the Middle East being killed 
for Christ. We aren't persecuted yet. We're not. But while we're here, what does it mean for us to take up our cross here in America? It means we're willing to be humiliated, shamed, rejected, and suffer for him. Remember, that's the way Jesus walked. Jesus walked towards humiliation, suffering, rejection, and death. And he calls us to do likewise. John tells us in 1 John 2, verse 6, when he writes, The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. You want to follow Christ? You want to be his disciple? Then deny yourself. Walk as he walked, and he walked to the cross. And for so many of us here, because we are removed from persecution, we are removed from our lives being threatened, so many of us would say, well, I would surely do that for Christ. I'm willing to lay it all down for him. I would carry my cross. I would do it. So many of us say, we, of course, can answer this command. How can you say that when you won't even be mildly inconvenienced for Jesus? Some of us say, I'll die for Christ. I'll live for him. I'll deny myself. But don't ask me to be inconvenienced for Jesus. Don't ask me to give up something I like. Don't ask me to give an hour of my time. Don't ask me to give time to read the word. Don't ask me to pray. Don't ask me to worship. Don't ask me to share my faith. I'll die for Christ, but I surely won't live for him. Does that make any sense? This is where many of us are at today. It's so easy to say right here when dying for Christ is so kind of theoretical. It's possible. It's probably not going to happen. It's easy to say, well, of course I would do it. But would you? If you don't even live for him? Would you really die for someone you will not currently live for? We, are you really willing to deny yourself, deny your dreams, deny your passions, deny your wants in this life? Are you willing to lay it all down for the cause of Christ if you won't even be willing to lay it down an hour of your time? Because Christ isn't calling you to follow him when it's convenient. He's not calling you to lay it down when you feel like it. He is saying, if you're going to follow me, the cost is high. If you're going to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself. Take up your cross. Be willing to die for my glory. And then you can follow me. Listen, we make being a believer so easy here in our culture. We tell people it requires nothing of them. It's just a little add-on to your life. You just get baptized and you're good to go. No, no, no. To be a disciple means everything about you is no longer about you. It's about Jesus. And that is a high cost. That is a high cost for many that we're not willing to make. But our problem is we often only focus on verse 34. We stop here. We stop at the cost and we don't recognize the gain. Because while the cost is high, the gain is greater. Jesus goes on to say in verse 35 through 37, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? What can anyone give in exchange for his life? Now your Bible may say soul, but in the original languages it means the same thing. Life, not just your physical life, your eternal life. What can a man give in exchange for his eternal soul? What can a man give in exchange for his eternal life? And what we often say as believers is that we are more willing to partake in these temporary sacrifices and enjoy the indulgences of the world and say, it's okay for me to do what the world says to do because I don't want to sacrifice. I don't want to make these temporary sacrifices. We don't realize what we're saying is that temporary sacrifice is worse than eternal suffering. Jesus right here lays it out. If you're not willing to follow me, if you're not willing to lay down your life, if you're not willing to deny yourself, you are saying that you would rather gain the whole world and lose your soul. You'd rather suffer for all eternity than sacrifice momentarily. Is that what we're trying to say? As believers, I'm not talking about those who claim to be Christian but have never given their life to Christ and just use it as a title. I'm talking about real believers. Do we really want to say that we want to focus more on the temporary sacrifices we're making and less on the eternity that we have in Christ? Yes, the cost is high, but what we're gaining is so much greater. What we're gaining is greater. This world, it's going to pass away. This world is dying. This world is decaying. 
Paul says something similar in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He said, for this world in its current form is passing away. We know that when Jesus returns, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Do you really want to spend the limited time you have on this earth giving in to temporary pleasure, temporary satisfaction, temporary happiness, when Jesus offers eternal satisfaction, eternal joy, eternal purpose? It won't fade away, but our pursuit of the world, it will. Will And when you pursue the world instead of pursuing Jesus, you're saying, my soul is worth whatever the world can offer me. My soul can be bought. I don't want to sacrifice for Jesus. I'll go on Sundays. I'll go on Wednesdays. But the rest of the time, that's for me. And when you choose the world over Jesus, you're robbing yourself of something greater. Because Jesus is greater than whatever the world may offer you. Yes, there are going to be things that our flesh is going to want to do, and we're going to think we're miserable having to give them up. Yes, there are going to be pet sins in our lives that make our lives a little more comfortable in our minds, make it a little more bearable that we're going to have to give up to follow Jesus. And for so many of us, we're going to be so focused on what we're giving up instead of realizing that when we give up the world, we gain Jesus. When we give up the flesh, we give up the desires of our sin, the desires of the mind, the desires of our sinful hearts, we gain Christ. We gain the one who created us, the one who knows us, the one who knows your deepest and darkest secrets. You know those ones you don't want to tell anyone else about because they'll judge you? He knows them. He knows the depths of your sin. And he loves you anyway. We don't tell people about those deep, dark secrets, those deep, dark sins we struggle with because we know they'll reject us, but Jesus doesn't. He knows them. As Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knows you intimately. He knows you better than you know yourself and anyone on this planet will ever know you. He knows the depths of your sin and he loves you anyway. He'll never cast you out. He'll never tell you you're not good enough. He calls you to come to him, to experience him, to walk with him, to go down the path that he provides, a path that is more beautiful and more majestic than any path the world offers. Because Jesus is better. But when we say that I don't want to make these sacrifices for Jesus, we're saying I'd rather go back to a world that wants to drown me in misery and sorrow and temporary pleasure because it hates me than being in a relationship with the one who saved me because he loves me. Think about that for a moment. Yes, being a Christian, being a disciple, you're going to have to sacrifice, but what are you gaining? Jesus. You're gaining Jesus. You're gaining the one that we don't deserve to be in a relationship with. We're gaining the one who died on the cross for our sin, who loves us unconditionally. We're gaining the one who never casts us out, who never says be better, who never says you're not good enough for me. We are following the one who loves us, who molds us, who sustains us, and who's coming again for us. But because of the sacrifices we're called to make, so many of us are ashamed of him. So many of us have to apologize for what Jesus has said. We have to kind of explain away what Jesus calls us to do here. You will never find somebody more happy with themselves than a supposed believer who somehow justifies their sin. Think about that for a moment. How happy are those people who claim to be a Christian and then find a loophole, if you will, in the Bible and say, well, I can commit this sin. There's no problem. They're happy about it. And what they're saying is they're ashamed of what Christ calls them to give up. They're ashamed to accept that what Christ says is sin is sin. And then Jesus says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Remember last week how I said one of the top ten things you didn't want to hear from Jesus was, Get behind me, Satan. Number one is, Depart from me, I never knew you. Depart from me, those of you who claim to be a believer who claim to be a Christian, but you never gave your life to Christ. Depart from me, all of you who use Christianity as your own personal benefit, who use it just to get places in life but never actually follow Jesus. Depart from me, those of you who try to rationalize your sin, who are embarrassed by me, who are ashamed by me. Depart from me, for I never knew you. And there are those who claim to be followers of Christ who have never given their life to Christ. 
And that's who this verse is for. Those who are ashamed by the cost of the disciples, those who are ashamed of the Christ who calls them, Christ says, I will be ashamed of you. Yes, there are temporary sacrifices to make, but they're so much better than eternal suffering. So much better. There is a real cost, but the gain is greater. What do we truly gain as disciples? We gain for eternity what the disciples are going to see for a moment. Chapter 9, verse 1 says, And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come in power. Now this is a pretty hotly debated verse. People have many different opinions on what this verse means. I'll be honest with you, I believe he's talking about the transfiguration. What's about to happen in this story where James, John, and Peter go to the mountain and they see Jesus in his glory with Elijah and Moses and God says, this is my son. Listen to him. I am well pleased. He's my beloved son. They see for a moment the glory of Christ. And what they saw for a moment, we see for eternity. What they saw for a moment that led them to awe and wonder, we experience every day for our eternity. The glory of Christ forever, seeing the one who was better, seeing the one who died on the cross for our sins, seeing the one who sustains us, that's what we gain. As a believer, you don't give your life to Christ just to gain heaven. You give your life to Christ to gain Christ. Heaven is just a really nice fringe benefit. What do we gain? Jesus. Following him is costly, but the gain is greater because we gain him. We gain the one who's better. We gain the one who is better than anything this world offers. We gain the one who is more beautiful, who is more awesome, who is more amazing, who is more loving. We gain the one who gives joy. We gain the one who gives purpose, who satisfies. We gain him for eternity. When you begin to understand, you begin to realize you're not really being called to sacrifice that much to gain such a great Christ. So how do we as disciples move from focusing only on what it's what costing us. And how do we begin to follow Christ truly? Well, this story teaches us that if we want to follow Christ, we want to be disciples, the story tells us to do not focus on the cost of following, but on the one you're following. Do not focus on the cost of following, but on the one you're following. Like I said, if we get stuck just looking at the sacrifices, all the sins we're saying no to, all the fun pleasures of the world we're saying no to, all the things in the world that give us temporary satisfaction, temporary fulfillment, temporary happiness, and we only focus on what we're saying no to, then of course we're going to be bitter. Of course we're going to be angry. Of course we're going to wonder if it's worth it. But when we focus on the one we're following, we focus on Jesus and how much better he is, how much more beautiful he is, how much more magnificent that he is, then we'll realize we're not being called to sacrifice a whole lot because he's better. You know, you guys pretty much know this at this point, but Renee and I haven't necessarily had what you call a normal story that leads to us being together. It's pretty weird. A lot of twists and turns. Basically, Renee had to discover that she did love me even though I was so faithful and nice to her and she just had to deal with some own sin in her life, but no big deal. She is going to beat me for that later, just so you all know. (laughs) But our proposal is no different. Our proposal is kind of odd, too. You see, after dating her for about three months, I realized I loved her. And I also realized it's only a matter of time before she realizes she can do better. So I'm going to lock it down. Because then it's a sin for her to leave me. Think ahead, y'all. But, so I asked her dad for his blessing. He gave it to me. And I had this whole plan mapped out. We were going to go on this awesome date in Tulsa. We were going to go to the most, one of the most beautiful parts of all of Tulsa, Oklahoma, a place called the center of the universe. I really don't know why it's called that, but it is. And I had all this mapped out. We had all our friends coming to celebrate with us, going to be at this spot. I was going to drop to one knee, and I could only picture how she was going to react when I dropped down to one knee. I thought she's going to, through tears in her eyes, just be so shocked. And that she's going to say yes when I ask her to marry me. She's going to hug me. She's going to kiss me. She's going to love me. And I thought this was going to happen. I couldn't wait for it. And so we finally got to our destination. And as we were walking to this meeting spot, I was reciting this speech I had been preparing for like two months at that point. And I dropped to one knee. I pulled out the ring. And I opened it. And I said, will you marry me? And she said back, are you joking? 
But, but hold on, I thought maybe she's in shock. Maybe she doesn't expect it, so I'll assure her with the ring in my hand that you can clearly see that's not a joke. So I said, no, it's, it's not a joke. Will you marry me? And her response, sure. <laughs> sure. And it was said in such a way where I thought, has she realized she can do better, but now she's stuck? Is that what's going on there? And then I thought, you know what? It's all fine. She said, sure, which means yes, I guess. So we got up and I hugged her and I thought, now she's going to be excited. Now it's going to sit in what happened. And then she starts to hit me. She starts to hit me because I lied to her about where our plans were ending up for that night. Like, yo, it was anticlimactic. I had this whole grand vision and I didn't get any of it. I got, are you kidding? Sure. And I'm mad at you. And you know, in that moment, I'll be honest with you though, it really didn't bother me. It didn't. It didn't bother me that she said sure. It didn't bother me that she started to hit me after she put the ring on her finger. It didn't bother me because all I could think about was I get to marry her. I get to marry her. And you know, when I was thinking about proposing to her and working through that and I dropped down to one knee, you know what I wasn't thinking about? I wasn't thinking about all the sacrifices I was going to have to make. I wasn't thinking about the fact that I was going to have to live with somebody. I didn't think about how I was going to have to sacrifice my time or sacrifice maybe things I want to do or sacrifice my own personal space, which I enjoy. I didn't think I was going to sacrifice my desire to not be vulnerable to people, to let someone in to know me. I didn't think about all of that. Because I was only focused on the beauty of the one I was asking to marry me. The sacrifices didn't matter. The gain was greater. And you and I as disciples, we got to stop looking at what we're sacrificing. Because when we only focus on what we're sacrificing, we are failing to see how beautiful Christ is. How much better he is. How much better he is than whatever we're sacrificing. That to gain Christ is to gain all that we need. we got to stop focusing on just how much it costs to be a believer and focus on the one we gain, who we are following Paul understood this in Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians 3, verses 7 through 10, he says, or I'm sorry, 11. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be lost because of Christ. And more than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness by my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Paul got it. Paul understood All the things the world said you're giving up, all the things the world says are a gain to you. Paul says, they are dung to me because I know I'm gaining Christ. Paul understood the beauty of Jesus. Paul understood the majesty of Jesus, the awesomeness of Jesus. Paul said, I don't care what I'm giving up because my Jesus is better. And as disciples... As those who want to flourish in this life, as those who want to know Christ more intimately, that will only happen when we stop focusing on what we're giving up and we focus on the beauty of the one we're following because he is better. So yes, count the cost. It is real. It is high. But focus on the cross, on what Jesus gave for you. And find Jesus in the path he calls you to walk to be the more beautiful and flourishing way. Focus on him because the gain is greater than the cost. Would you bow with me this morning? Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us for often focusing on what we are giving up from the world to follow you and not focusing on you. Jesus, you are better. Jesus, you are faithful. 
And this morning, I know there are those who have given their life to you, but maybe they're not following you like they should. And Lord, I pray that this morning you will give them the strength to come forward and to pray and get right with you. And Lord, there is anyone in here who is a follower of you, but maybe they're focusing on the world. I pray they will repent this morning and come to you. Lord, I also want to pray for those in here who are not believers. You know who they are. We may not. But God, save them by your grace this morning. Save them. Convict their heart of their sin and lead them to repent and believe that Jesus is better. And help us to worship with them and rejoice with them when you do. Father, we love you and we trust you. In Jesus, we know that you are better. In your name that we pray, amen. You come this morning as the Lord leads.